my son. They've run out of wine. Mother, my time has not yet come. If not now, when? Father. It has begun. What has? Miracles. Signs and wonders. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You have experienced a miracle, Mary. I saw him. It was incredible. Our Father. Our Father. Who art in heaven. Who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. The man has a following. He's a rogue who answers to no one. You asked me before if I knew his name. Now everyone knows his name. And I fear for his safety. Throw this down for a catch. Do you think that impossible things can happen? That overturn the laws of nature? <laughs> that cannot be explained. Rise. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. This is different. Get used to different. My whole life, I have wondered if I would see this day. Follow me, Nicodemus, and you'll see more. God loves the world in this way. That he gave his only son. I'm going to tell everyone. <laughs> I was counting on it. Anything is possible now. Don't you see? Let's go. I was one way. And now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. Is gonna be good. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. As Christians, it is our joy and it is our privilege to be able to invite people to come to taste and see that the Lord is good. And as Christians, we also have the opportunity to taste and see uh, in greater ways, more and more, over and over again, as we learn more and more about him and through uh, experiences, through a, a relationship with him. We, we learn more and more about him. We taste and see more and more how good he is. So we want to taste and see, and we want to invite others to come to taste and see that the Lord is good. And we're going to do that in a, a way that's different than anything we've ever done before. It's a creative way, but it's something different that we've ever done before. Now, I will say some things uh, are going to be the same. Some things remain unchanged and, and never will change. Uh, of course, we're going to study and teach from the Word of God. Of course, we're going to look at Scripture, uh, the, the Bible, as our only accurate source of truth. And then we're going to test all that we say and we do and we consider with the Word of God. But this summer, again, as a creative way to help us to taste and see like never before, our sermons and our lessons are going to follow the outline of this uh, TV series that is all about the life of Christ. It's called The Chosen. This TV series was completely funded by free will offerings from believers all over the world it's because they wanted to see the life of Christ fleshed out uh, on a, a television screen. They wanted to see it uh, like no other Jesus project had done it before. 
not a, a, a single movie, not a, a mini series, not, a, not a, a short film about one event in Jesus' life, but instead a multi-season television show that takes its time, that has time to develop the characters, that gives realistic context to these events in Jesus' life, and provides the freshest, the most realistic perspectives that any creative team has ever uh, created, has ever uh, put together, has ever produced. That last part is probably my own personal opinion. I know others share it, but it's a, it's a personal opinion. But this fact is not an opinion. Believers all around the world have funded this story. They have made the life of Christ a television series that has shattered records of any television series series. There is no other television series, no other video project that has been crowdfunded like this. This has been completely crowdfunded. That means people, individuals who thought, I would like to see that happen, funded this. They have made this the, the largest, by far, the largest crowdfunded TV series of all time. Not religious TV series of all time. Not the largest uh, crowdfunded TV series that was, you know, uh, religious or non-religious. The largest period shattered the record because people wanted to see the life of Christ on film. They wanted to see it accurate. They wanted to see it done differently. And so individuals and churches funded uh, to the tune of $10 million dollars season one, to make season one happen. Since then, season two was completely funded, filmed, wrapped. It's available to watch today. Season three, completely funded again. It's filming as we speak. It started filming in April. Season four already has a little over $2 million uh, in its little funding account. So well on their way to funding season four. This is how excited people are about the life of Christ, and that is an exciting thing. That could be a game changer. But people who have never tasted and seen. And people who have tasted and seen, but never quite like this before, they are tasting and seeing right now. They're tasting and seeing through a television series that directs its viewers with a little blurb at the beginning of the series that directs its viewers to go and read the Gospels. We've made this TV series to hopefully help supplement your uh, following Christ, your meeting Christ, your tasting and seeing Christ. But it says right there, literally in black and white, black background, white text, you come on Tuesday nights, you'll see it for yourself. Go and read the Gospels for yourself. This TV series tells its viewers, go and read the Bible. Go and read the Scriptures. Go and read the God-breathed written word for yourself. This morning and throughout this summer, I want to invite you to imagine a little bit. I want to invite you to enjoy considering, and this may sound odd, but it won't here in a few minutes when we look into the scriptures. I want to invite you to enjoy considering what we don't know as well as what we know. What we know about the life of Christ, but also some of the things that we don't know about Jesus' life here on earth. Because this is a truthful statement here. The more we know about Jesus, the more we know that there's more we don't know. As much as we may know uh, about Jesus, there's always so much more that we, we don't know. And the more we realize this, the more we want to know. The hungrier we get to know more. And that's a good thing, to have that, that humility and that hunger. To know there's more that we don't know. But to hunger to know more, that's a, that's a good thing. In fact, two times at the end of the Gospel of John, John specifically points out that Jesus did other significant things which were not written down. He actually points this out. In John chapter 21, verses 24 and 25, John says, this is the disciple, he's speaking of himself here, this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Again, John's talking about himself. He's talking about his eyewitness accounts, the things he wrote down in his gospel. And he says, these things were written down. I'm the one who wrote these things. We can believe the things that were written. But the next verse does say, and there are also many other things which Jesus did. So in contrast to that which was written down, right? It's inferred very clearly. We can, we can infer here. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Now, think with me here. 
If we considered this verse, if we paused and we treated this verse of scripture like any other verse in scripture, where we, we investigate and we research and we try to figure out why would God, we consider why would God inspire John to write this down? What's the application to me? What can we learn from this? Well, what, what would be the conclusion? What can we conclude from the fact that God inspired John to write down that there's lots of other things that Jesus did that you don't even know about? because they weren't written down. We, we couldn't write it all down. We could only conclude that there must be at least some kind of value in considering these many other things. Right, there's gotta be at least some value or God wouldn't have inspired John to write this down. Well, I'll tell you what I think that value has to be. That value has to be, and it's simple, <laughs> that value has to be in remembering in simply remembering that although there's so much about Jesus that we have tasted and seen, there's so much that we haven't. It's about remaining humble and hungry. It's about never drawing our own personal box around Jesus, who he is and who we, we think we know for a fact exactly who he is. But instead, always hungering and thirsting to know more and more and more about him and about his story. And the creators of the chosen, they have tried to help with not only what we know from Scripture and portraying it very well, very accurately, very well done, high quality stuff, uh, thorough stuff. But not only what we know, but also with some of the things, some of the details that we don't know. Filling in some of those gaps, putting a little bit of that flesh on that bone for us. One of their top goals, based on their own words is to make the followers and the characters that we see uh, in the scriptures and we see, we're gonna see on the film, to make them real. To make them real to, to us, the viewer. Giving realistic backstories to some of the most well-known characters in the Bible, but also fleshing out some of the other people that, that just receive you know, a passing mention in the scripture. Putting a little, little uh, context behind why they might have been there. Or maybe exactly why they were there. And the intended result, they say, the creators of the chosen, the intended result is that viewers see the people in the Bible as real people who dealt with the same types of issues that we all have to deal with. That's their words. That's what they say. And you come on Tuesday nights and you're going to see in the chosen, the disciples have family, they have friends, they have reputations to uphold, they have senses of humor, they struggle with finances, and they get stressed out, just like we all do. They're just like us. And that idea that they're just like us and that we need to know that the people in the Bible were just like us, that's not something that a TV show came up with. They got that from the scriptures. The scriptures tell us, don't you forget this. As great as some of these people seem, don't you forget, they're just like you. They're just like us. The scriptures encourage us to keep in mind that the people in the Bible are just that. People in the Bible. Right? They are human beings like you and me, not superheroes. James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18 is one of these passages that makes it abundantly clear that God wants us to know this. And God reminds us this. James chapter 5, verse 17 and 18 says, Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. With a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain for three years and six months. Then he prayed again. And the sky poured rain. And the earth produced its fruit. I don't know if you know this or not, but Elijah is a pretty well-known prophet. A pretty well-known miracle-working prophet, by the way. And God reminds us here, through his word, that he was a person just like you. Elijah had a nature just like ours. We have a tendency to, uh, not all the time, I get it, and some of you are probably better than others, we have this tendency to spiritualize people in the Bible right out of the realm of humanity, right? Don't we do that sometimes? The, well, you know, I'm no Moses, you know, right? Like, like he was some kind of uh, superhuman being. Like something between, you know, uh, Jesus and angel and humans. I don't know where he fell in here, but, but these people in the Bible, you know, they're not like us. No, they are. And the Bible reminds you of that. The Bible tells you, don't forget it. These people were people just like us. The scriptures, uh, the, these verses here in James 5 remind us that the people we read about in the scriptures were real people just like us. If we read more about Elijah, if you've read more about Elijah, you know, he got really discouraged, right? Miracle working prophet. 
was able to command the rain to just stop for three years and six months and then have it pour forth again. And he got really discouraged. He got really discouraged, just like us. David was sinful, just like us. Thomas doubted just like us. Timothy had to face the reality that people treated him differently because of his age, just like us. Jesus was tempted, just like us. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, right? Just like us. Moses found out that he could learn to lead, just like us. Martha wanted to serve, just like us. The list goes on and on and on. We could pull example after example. When we watch The Chosen together starting this Tuesday night here at the building at 6.30, we're going to see this reality that these characters were real people with real lives. They were people just like us. Nicodemus had to face his pride. Mary Magdalene had to face her demons. Matthew had his issues. Uh, Simon Peter had to, had to uh, tame his impulses. They all dealt with relationships and, and finances and difficulties and problems and decisions. They are real people. Again, not superheroes. Now, they're great examples, and I'm not trying to take them down uh, any lower than they are. I'm just trying to say, hey, you can be a faithful hero of the faith, too. And the chosen is going to do a great job of taking care of showing us these are real people. This is what it really looks like to follow Jesus. And sometimes it's not as perfect as we'd like it to be. In fact, all the time it's not as perfect as we'd like it to be. But they're real people like us. They had real lives, and it's okay in fact, it's good to consider that the, uh, what the lives of Jesus and his followers may have looked like in real life, so to speak. I've never said this really out loud before. It's just a thought that rolls around in my head. And, uh, well, I did share it with Kathy um, Friday night, um, kind of talking about the sermon a little bit. But um, other than that, I don't think I've really shared this with anybody. Um, believe it or not, I don't share everything that's in my head. I know that may shock some of you. But I've always had this thought, uh, all the way from, I, I don't know how soon it started, I know I was little, but as far back as I can remember, I've always had this thought in my mind that when I finally do meet the real Jesus, and now granted, when I was younger, this was not as spiritual of a statement as it's going to sound like, I mean, this was just a little kid with a weird imagination, okay, but it's matured, it's grown, but this thought has never left my mind that when I do finally meet the real Jesus, I just think it's imp like crazy to think that there's any way that he's not going to be different than the way uh, I've envisioned him. Like, I'm just sure that when I meet the real Jesus, I'm going to be like, wasn't expecting that. You know, there's going to be something. And I'm not talking about his appearance, okay? Uh, I I'm not really that concerned about his appearance. I I'm really not. And I don't mean that to sound, you know, spiritual, you know, overly spiritual. I just mean like his, his attitude, his personality, his sense of humor, you know, his tone, his, all this stuff. Like I'm just assuming that I'm going to be surprised and I've never ever thought like which way it's going to go. Like I've never thought, you know, like I bet he's going to be harsher than I think. Because as soon as I wonder about that, I think, I'll bet I'll be surprised at like how graceful and merciful and funny he is. Like, like every time I go in one direction, I'm like, there's no way. There's no way that I'm going to know. And like I said, what started out as just this little thought from a little kid has now matured into an understanding that we would be arrogant. We'd be arrogant to think that we know exactly what Jesus was and is like. We know all we need to know. We know all we need to know to get to heaven, to love him, to have a relationship, to understand his doctrine and exactly how we're supposed to live our lives. But when it comes to truly knowing him as a person, we'd be arrogant to think that we know exactly what he's like, exactly what he was like, exactly what he is like. And scripture bears that out, does it not? Scripture bears that out. We see it in the word of God and it's portrayed in the chosen uh, in, a, in a very, uh, they, they've portrayed it very well. But Jesus is not, who people thought he'd be. We see that in the scriptures. And like I said, the TV series portrays it well also. Jesus is not who people thought he'd be. Jesus is not who people want him to be. But we learn through the scriptures and it's portrayed on the chosen as well that he's the son of God and he's who we need him to be. He's not who people thought he'd be. He's not who people want him to be. But he's the son of God and he's who we need him to be. 
There's so much that we do know. Don't misunderstand me through any of this. But the scriptures themselves remind us that there's so much that we don't know. And the point of all this is that the more you know, the more you know that there's more you don't know. You know that. It becomes a fact. And that makes you want to know even more. <laughs> that makes you want to know more. And it makes you want to know uh, more, more often. Right? It, it creates a hunger. Let's look at another statement from uh, John near the end of his gospel. We looked at one statement in John chapter 21. Let's go back just one chapter there and look at the last two verses of John chapter 20. Okay? In John chapter 20, verses uh, 30 and 31, John gives us his purpose for writing down what he did write down. <laughs> he says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples. Are signs a pretty big deal in the Bible? Yeah. So significant things. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written. These have been written for a purpose. Hear this? These have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. You see the theme again? Same thing, he just kind of flipped the order that he shared it with, but John tells us that there are things that are written, and yet at the same time, there's this acknowledgement that there are also many things which are just not. Just, they just weren't written down. You just don't know what he did. You just don't have any record of it. But John is telling us here that the things that were written down are the most important. So we're not missing anything that we have to have. Okay, don't misunderstand this. John's telling us here that the things that were written down were the most important. These are the things that we can know for sure and these were the things that were selected specifically to be written down so to help us believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and through that belief to have life in his name. Yet even still, God has moved John to note the fact that there is still just so much significant things, signs that his disciples saw, so many things that just were not written down. And many things Jesus did that, that we don't know about. And the more you know, the more you know there's more you don't know. But another theme we see in the Bible and that's also portrayed in the Chosen TV series is this. The more that we follow Jesus, the more we believe. And the more that we believe, the more we follow. It's just a cycle that just goes over and over. And more belief helps you to follow more. And more following helps you to believe more. Flip over to John chapter 2 uh, with me. John chapter 2, we're going to read verse 11 in just a second. Um, check this out. <laughs> At this point, Jesus already has followers. He already has disciples. He already has a, a group of people following him. And he and his followers attend a wedding together in Cana. You remember this? Where he performs his first public miracle? What does he turn water into? Right, so this is his first public miracle, turning water into wine. And John chapter 2, verse 11, records for us how his followers, people who were following him, responded to having seen this. These are his disciples. It says in verse 11, the beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. That's talking about the, the wedding feast there, the, the water into wine miracle. The beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now think about this. They already believed in him. They were already his disciples. They were already following him. That's why they were at a wedding with this guy. You know, could you imagine the disciples? You know, we're going to a wedding? You said you make us fishers of men. We're going to go turn the world upside down. And we're going to a wedding? But they went because they were following him. They were followers. They were going to go where he went. They were going to learn from him what they could learn from him. They already believed him in though and they were already following him. But when he performed this first public miracle, the Bible says that these followers believed in him. See, the more you follow, the more you believe. And the more you believe, the more you follow. Same thing happens uh, just a little bit later on in John chapter 2. You remember when Jesus told the Jews, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again? Remember that? Remember that statement at least? Well, John tells us in verse 21 that Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body, right? He's talking about his resurrection. Well, in uh, verse 22, John chapter 2, verse 22, it says, So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples, those are his followers, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed. 
They already believed, didn't they? But it says they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. See, the more they followed, the more they believed. And the more they believed, the more they followed. Just a few chapters later in John chapter 6, the Gospel of John chapter 6, we read about Jesus making that strange, hard statement, right? In verse 53, John chapter 6, verse 53, where he says, Truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. It's a weird statement when you're just not ready for it. We've had all our lives to study this, to, to, to learn what this means. But this was the first time it had ever been spoken, first time anybody had heard it, and it freaked people out. And Scripture tells us in verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. They went away. They weren't following anymore. So Jesus turns to his uh, closest followers, the 12, right? And in verse 67, he said, you do not want to go away also, do you? You don't want to quit following me as well, do you? That's what he's asking. Verse 68, listen. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. Now, to whom shall we go is a statement of following, right? We're going to keep following you. To whom shall we go? We're going to keep following you. And then there's a statement of belief. You have the words of eternal life. We believe that that's what you have. We're going to keep following you because we believe you. Lord, we're not going anywhere, he's saying. They followed and believed. Now because of their belief, they followed all the more. They weren't going anywhere. It had strengthened the resili resiliency of their ability to follow. They weren't going to go away. They're like, no, I don't really care what you say at this point. We know who you are. We're following you. The more you follow Jesus, the more you believe, the more you believe, the more you follow. And do you remember that concerned father that came to Jesus to see if he would uh, cast out this spirit that had possessed his son, was throwing him on the ground into fires, into water? I mean, it was really a, a horrible thing for this child and for this father, for the parents to go through. Well, Jesus said to him, all things are possible to him who believes. All things are possible to him who believes. In Mark chapter 9, verse 24, Scripture says, Scripture says, immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. <laughs> That's kind of a strange statement too. I do believe, help my unbelief. H have you ever felt that struggle though? I mean, I mean, you felt it, but it's odd to see it in Scripture and for somebody else. You thought you were just weird and like, like no, I'm really sold out, but I also still struggle. You felt it, I'm sure. This is how our trust and our, our obedience grow all the time. Our believing and our following, our following and believing. This is how it grows all the time. Lord, I've come to you. I'm going to follow you, Jesus, because I believe in you. I believe what you say. And then as you do that, you believe more. And as you believe more, you follow more. But what makes us do that? This is how it works. And we can all from experience say, yeah, yeah, that's right. When I do start following, I do start believing more. And the more I believe, the more I do follow. But what, what's the, I hate to say the science behind it, but, but why does that work that way? Why does it happen like that? What is it that makes us believe, have a desire to follow, and then grow in our belief the more we follow? What draws people to Jesus, I guess? What is it that would make a tax collector climb up in a tree to get a better view of Jesus and then decide to, um, you know, sell his possessions, half of his possessions, give it to the poor, and then uh, pay back four times as much as he had stolen as a result of meeting Jesus? What is it that would make a, a woman ignore the shame of her very uh, well-known, publicly known sin and come into the house of her very accusers to kiss his feet and to anoint them with perfume? What is it that would make a high-profile religious leader ask for a secret nighttime meeting with Jesus, risking everything, his reputation, his status, his position, risking everything to do so? What is it that would, would make highly successful people abandon their livelihoods? What is it that would eventually cause people to, to give up their very lives and to endure cultural and social scorn and ridicule? What is it that has drawn millions of people to him for the past couple thousand years? What is it that has the power to pull people away from addiction and to cause people to reject materialism? What is it that empowers people to leave the false religions of their forefathers? What is it that 
accounts for the fervent passion and the confidence of Christians all over the world. Not just here in Madison. We're not just some strange little group. This is all over the world. What is it? What is the motivation for a life of self-denial and, and generosity? What is it about Jesus that draws people to him? I'll tell you what it is. And it's simple. It's not simple in terms of how powerful it is because for Jesus to be all these things is a pretty big deal. But it's simple to put our finger on what it is that draws us. It is the overwhelming beauty and perfection and goodness and power and wisdom and love and glory and essence and nature and being and person of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And all we're trying to do through this whole thing is get a glimpse. To get a glimpse of that, the drawing power of Jesus. That's what this whole message series, that's what this whole summer is about, is to get a glimpse of that real drawing power, not just the black and white, not just uh, pages that some people will just flip right over, but instead to make Jesus as real as we can this summer. So that people are like, I like that guy. <laughs> I want to follow that guy. I want to follow him and I'm going to believe him and I'm going to believe him and I'm going to follow him. We want to get a glimpse of that, that drawing power of Jesus. Think about this. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Scripture says, Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when, we, that when he appears, that's talking about his second coming, when he returns, we will be like him because, listen to this, we will see him just as he is. Remember little Jake thinking about what he's actually going to be like? There's coming a day. There's coming a day when we will see him just like he is. There will be no unknowns anymore. We'll see him just like he is someday. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10 takes it just a little bit further here. It says, when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day, still talking about the, the second coming, the resurrection of Jesus, and to be marveled at to be marveled at among all who have believed. So there's coming a day when we're going to see Jesus just as he is and there's, uh, that he's coming to be marveled at by all of us who have believed. But then Peter takes it even further, another step further, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13, when he says, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, okay, when he is seen as he is, when you see his glory, the second coming, that's the resurrection, at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. Woo! Let's take a step back and look at the picture that these three scriptures just painted for us. There is coming a day when, when the Lord returns, we're going to see him just like he is. And on that day, he's coming back to be marveled at by those who have believed in him. And we will rejoice with exaltation. That means we're going to be overjoyed to see him. We're going to be overjoyed when his presence and his glory is revealed. Now, I know. I know that we'll never know these things in full. We'll never know all there is to know about Jesus until that day. But why wouldn't we do all that we can do to get a glimpse of who he really is now? Why wouldn't we do everything we can do to marvel at him now? Why wouldn't we do all that we can do to rejoice with exaltation, to be overjoyed by his glory now? Church, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we don't know, okay? We've covered that, <laughs> And the more that we know, the more that we know, there's more that we don't know. And the more we follow, the more we believe, and the more we believe, the more we follow, we, 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 got, we got that. But I also want you to remember this. The more you believe and follow, the more you change. The more you believe and follow, the more you change. We have so many examples of scriptures, in the scriptures, of people who... After they met Jesus, they were never the same again. They were completely changed by him and changed forever. They, they, they just were never the same. And those examples aren't just in the scriptures, by the way. Those examples, some of them are sitting in this building right now among us. People who have been changed forever by Jesus, by meeting him, by knowing him. That's what it's all about. 
That's, that's what this is all about. And I'm not talking about this sermon series anymore. I'm talking about this life, this following Jesus thing. This is what it's all about, inviting people to come to taste and see that the Lord is good. It's about inviting people to come to meet Jesus and to be changed by him forever, forever. We're not doing this message series because other churches have done it. We're not doing it because it's cool. We're not doing this because it fits really nicely into a couple months for a summer program. We're not doing this because it came in some prepackaged kit like a, you know, a, a canned VBS program where all the work's done for you because it's not. We're doing this to get a greater, deeper, wider view of Jesus for ourselves, but also and especially to invite others so that others can come to him, to meet him, so they might be drawn to him, come to know him and follow him and be changed by him forever. So I want to give you a very real challenge this morning. And this isn't a big deal, okay? This is not a big deal. But I want to challenge you to invite your family, invite your friends, invite your coworkers, invite your grandkids, invite your kids, anybody you can. Anybody you have any kind of influence with whatsoever, somebody who might listen to you and, and, and might possibly take you up on your offer. And maybe even just for fun, try some people that you're pretty sure won't. But invite them to come and watch a TV show with us. Invite them to come on Tuesday nights at 6.30 here at the building when we start watching this series. We're going to watch one episode. They're like 35 to 45. There might be one that's close to 50 minutes long. We're not sitting here watching, you know, a two and a half hour, you know, crazy movie. It's an episode of a TV show. Invite them to come out this Tuesday to join you at 6.30 to join all of us. Let's pack this house to watch Jesus on film to see this very real portrayal of Jesus on the big screen up here. And then invite them back to come on Sunday at 10.30 to hear a message brought from his word, to see what the word of God has to say about what they saw that week on the big screen up here. Because as John said in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31 that we already looked at, yeah, Many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Here's a very creative, a, a, a very interesting, a very simple, a, a very easy way to invite people that you care about to come and experience Jesus like they never have before. To come to taste and to see that the Lord is good.